Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our Protect Our Province COVID-19 briefing for Alberta on Friday, September 3rd, 2021. We are live streaming today from the traditional and ancestral territory of many peoples. We are grateful to live and work in Alberta, a province on the traditional territory of 48 different First Nations and the unceded homeland of the Métis Nation. We acknowledge the many First Nations, Métis and Inuit who have lived in and cared for these lands for generations and who continuously strive to build a healthy and prosperous future for all who call this land home. Today's briefing has a live captioner in place for increased accessibility and is being presented in ASL. We are hopeful that this will improve the accessibility of our briefings for all Albertans. The Protect Our Province COVID-19 briefing is a regular panel of doctors and experts. We will endeavour to bring timely, accurate updates on the COVID-19 crisis in Alberta and take questions from the media. The views of our panellists are their own and do not represent any institutions they may be affiliated with. We have collectively gathered here as concerned Albertans, attempting to ensure that everyone in the province has access to as much information concerning COVID-19 in Alberta as possible. In addition to a brief COVID-19 update for Alberta, we will focus today on schools and take questions from the media and the community. We have a very large panel of experts with us today, beginning with Dr. Tassin Leda, a pediatrician, available to answer your questions about children and COVID-19. Dr. Wing Lee, the Communications Director for Support Our Students, answering questions about safer K-12 schools. Dr. Gosia Gasparovic, a developmental biologist, here to answer questions about COVID-19 transmission. Dr. Leila Asadi, an infectious disease physician with a Master in Public Health who can answer questions on navigating COVID-19 and the return to school. Dr. Lorianne Hardcastle, a law professor who specializes in public health law and policy. Jason Schilling, the president of the Alberta Teachers Association, here to answer questions around the ATA's expectations on the re-entry to school. Dr. Carolyn Bazanko, a clinical psychologist available to answer questions on COVID-19 and children's mental health. And with us again is Connor Rizicki, an aerosol scientist who can answer questions about airborne transmission and ventilation. We will begin with a brief update on Alberta's situation and open the floor to our panelists and questions. Thank you all for joining us today. To begin, I would like to welcome Dr. Shorts to update us on the current COVID-19 situation in Alberta and on the measures announced by the provincial government today. Dr. Schwartz is an infectious disease clinician and a researcher with a focus on global health. Thank you, Dr. Schwartz. So uh, thank you so much, Michelle. So um, as you can see, I am not uh, Joe Vipond, and so I don't have uh, all of the numbers that are at his disposal. Um, and in fact, the uh, province just released their numbers for today. Uh, in the last few minutes. And so what we've seen is that there's 1,401 new cases announced, including 118 um, that are in the ICU. And so uh, to put this into context, um, many of our viewers will have seen the uh, presser today that involved um, Verna Yu, in which she uh, said that there was a 95% bed occupancy rate in ICUs in the province right now. So what that means is that once we surpass 100%, um, we can still accommodate additional patients who are critically ill, but they are no longer going to be receiving the care that we um, would consider to be standard in this province. So for example, we might need to look at different models of care, uh, whereby nurses are looking after multiple patients. We may have multiple patients in the same room, which is something that we saw in uh, the second wave, and we might see um, other other models of uh, of care that I think that Albertans would agree is is suboptimal. And so, really, what that means is that whether you have COVID or not, um, we are going to do our best to look after you in the hospital. But we really can't uh, guarantee that you're going to have an ICU bed. And so, uh, it really is important that number one everybody stay safe and try do what they can to stay out of the ICU, particularly this long weekend, which is typically marred by trauma uh, on a, um, uh, and, and uh, motor vehicle accidents. And number two, we really do need to uh, work as, as, as desperately as we can with uh, uh, reflecting the true sense of urgency in order to bring down 
the number of cases. And so it's on the second point that I turn to the um, measures that were announced by uh, the Kenny government today. And so uh, there were four main measures that were um, were um, uh, announced. The first is that there's going to be mandatory masking inside in public spaces, with the exception of where individuals can stay um, uh, over two meters uh, apart. And so for those who caught uh, Connor Ruzwicki's presentation on Wednesday, we know that COVID is spread through airborne uh, transmission. And, and uh, in other words, it doesn't abide by these uh, restrictions of requiring uh, two meters in order to infect somebody. So uh, this is uh, a problem. Second of all, schools were not included in the uh, in the group um, for whom masking was uh, mandated. And so this is left to the discretion of local school boards. We've seen some that have been more willing to institute more meaningful restrictions and some that are lagging behind. Number two, there's going to be a uh, recommendation that unvaccinated individuals limit social gatherings. This one we can toss out the window. We know that individuals who are unvaccinated are less likely to do things that are um, going to benefit others uh, just by virtue of them not getting vaccinated. And so unsurprisingly, um, probably not many of them are going to actually follow this restriction. Number three is a peculiar one. This is an alcohol curfew, whereby uh, uh, establishments will no longer be able to serve alcohol after uh, 10 p.m. And this one, of course, doesn't make any sense. COVID doesn't care whether you're gathering at a bar at 9.59 or 10.01. Um, and this one really belies uh, Jason Kenney's um, ideological uh, intransigence. And so rather than uh, instituting vaccine uh, passports uh, by which individuals who are vaccinated would be the ones who would be filling up bars, spending their money and keeping businesses afloat. Um, but instead, um, they're going to be limiting all individuals from accessing these, uh, these uh, establishments. And consequently, this is really going to be uh, a death knell. Uh, uh, for uh, a lot of bars and restaurants. And then finally, um, cash incentive for um, vaccination. Of course, there's concern that this is now rewarding people who have uh, not been doing the right thing to protect one another. Uh, and it's at the expense of the taxpayer. And so in other words, this is moving money from individuals who did the right thing, who got vaccinated to those who are unvaccinated. Um, so uh, with no more ado, uh, I'm gonna pass this back to Michelle. Uh, to facilitate further discussion. Thank you very much, Dr. Schwartz. I expect over the coming days, a number of the members of Pop AB will have a variety of things to say on the measures or lack thereof that were announced today. Thank you very much. Next, I would like to bring into the stream Dr. Gasparovich, who is going to do a deeper dive into our numbers. Uh, hello, good afternoon. Thank you, Michelle. So if you could please show my second slide in the deck. It shall be up momentarily. Thank you. So we are still in the exponential growth of cases. So today we had 1400 new cases. Uh, this is the projection done more than a week ago, almost two weeks ago. And uh, the green dots are the numbers after the projection was done. And they still follow the purple line, which is, ex which is exponential growth and cases doubling every 14 days. If we continue like that, in mid-September, we will reach uh, 2,000 daily new cases. At, and that might be the place when we absolutely have ICU capacity full because at this at 2,000 daily new cases, ICUs were full in the third wave. And now the proportion of hospitalizations and ICUs to cases is very similar to what we had in the third wave. Um, also, there is there's a thing that if we do nothing, this curve won't bend magically down anytime soon. Uh, 
probably we can reach easily 4,000 daily new cases when doing nothing. And this is also what the model done by BC COVID-19 model modeling group shows. Uh, could I have a next slide, please? So the left two graphs are projections for Alberta done by BC COVID-19 modeling group. And as we can see, we are on track to very high level on the green line, upper left corner graph, on the very high levels of daily new cases. And lower, lower left corner graph shows hospitalizations and ICU, which will also continue to go up if no measures are taken. Next slide, please. And here's, so our growth, growth in cases is driven by Delta variant. This graph shows Delta variant on logarithmic, natural logarithm scale. So Y axis is 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, and so on. And we can see that most of the time since Delta was imported here, it grows exponentially in Alberta with a small moment when, when it was declining and it was from June 29th to July 12th. So basically after the, just after the, or in the moment of opening for summer. But what is important, it was going down after the end of school, uh, of end of in-person school. Uh, so probably that could drive it down a little bit, but then, the full reopening basically made it grow again. So basically we are almost like just for 12, 13 days, it was dipping, but otherwise it was growing exponentially almost all the time. And since July 12th, it was clear that it's not under control, it's growing exponentially and something should be done. Next slide, please. So now that's the slide from there are data from last year, September. So what happened then when we reopened schools? During the whole summer, so when you look like um, you have the first wave, then cases go slowly up. So they were till September, till mid-September, they were going slowly up, doubling. It was exponential growth, but with doubling every 60 days. So very, very slow yet persistent growth. And after then schools opened at in September, on September 1st, 16 days later, the growth switched to much faster, uh, much faster exponential surge and doubling of 2.5 weeks. And what is important, the beginning of the surge was September 17th, so many days before the Thanksgiving uh, and two weeks, 16 days after reopening the schools. Next slide, please. And here this graph shows again our daily new cases and with the dates of school closure, in-person school closures and in-person schools reopening. What we could observe was always after this dashed red lines when in-person school closes, we have the decline, like very, very often very rapid decline in cases. Of course, other closures were done as well then and other other measures were implemented, but schools were closed too. So somehow they contributed to the decline. And especially in the spring after May, I think it was May 7th when in-person schools were closed, but then there was super steep decline in cases uh, in children. And then when schools were reopened again on May 25th, I think, then the R value grew up by 20%, increased by 20%. It was almost immediate increase. So there is some correlation between school closure and school reopening and uh, and how the cases behave. Um, okay, thank you, that's... Okay, I can show also one, maybe one more slide. So that is a calculation done uh, by a person from Twitter who is uh, who has long COVID and and he has also a calculator and and can calculate some stuff. Uh, it's based on the method used by Dr. David Fisman, an infectious disease uh, professor from Ontario. So they show that seventy that Delta has seventy percent attack rate. So if we have a population under twelve unvaccinated, which is which is six hundred sixty four thousand kids. 
70% attack rate is if we let COVID spread widely, then 460,000 of those kids can get infected. Then calculating severe, severe illness in them, it would be 467. 437 kids with severe illness, so needing hospitalization. Critical illness would be 53 kids, so the ones that would need ICU, and the deaths around two to three kids. Um, and also what we know now is that, so it's, it's trying to put percentages in absolute numbers if we have 70% attack rate, what we could expect in absolute numbers in kids infected and having severe illness. Also, what is now known about Delta is that it's um, hospitalizations of kids in um, in Ontario are around 2.9, 2.7 times higher than were with uh, with infected for kids who were infected with previous variants. So it's almost three times increase in the odds ratio of being hospitalized as a kid when being infected with with uh, with COVID, with Delta variant. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I'm really Thank you very much for that, Dr. Gasparovich. We actually had a number of questions from the stream around hospitalization rate relating to tiny humans with Delta versus tiny humans from previous versions of the virus. So I think that there are a lot of people who were very interested in having that information today. So thank you very much. Now I would like to bring Dr. Wing Lee from Support Our Students into the conversation with us. They are going to look a little bit deeper at how schools were impacted during the previous waves and what we might see in the fall. Good afternoon. I will take a few minutes now uh, as this is our back to school focus and direct viewers to where they can find ongoing updates about school cases uh, and severe outcomes in school aged children from five to 19 years old. So Erin Toombs is a visual communicator and a dedicated Support Our Students volunteer who has been tirelessly tar charting the Alberta COVID-19 crisis as a whole and with also a focus on schools and school aged children. He's been an indispensable member of our school case tracking team from last year and he uses the government data and graphs to show trends in an accessible way to the general public. So I would like to direct the audience to bookmark this URL, uh, aarontombs.github.io, where he will compile, has been compiling all of the graphs uh, with um, many different angles of an analysis. And also follow at A-R-Y-N-T-O-O-M-B-S on Twitter for updates. So next slide, please. One specific page is under schools and students when you pull up this uh, site. Here you'll find the most current active case data that's updated daily uh, as long as the government is releasing the data. So yesterday government reported 84 active cases in infants under one, 509 cases in one to four years old, 762 cases in the five to nine years age group, and 1,578 cases in 10 to 19. And that number has gone up. I wasn't able to update the slide, but you can go to this URL and see to these numbers that have um, increased slightly. Next slide, please. We see here that we're almost approaching the peak of school age cases that we saw last November. However, we've only been in school for less than a week. So we saw grades 7 to 12 move online at the end of that month uh, last November. So it remains to be seen if there would be course of action by this government as we are approaching that peak. Next slide, please. We see also that Aaron has shown data separated by younger children versus older age groups. So this is just to show another uh, access point for information for those interested. Next slide. As we watch the rise of Delta and as schools reopen this week, no doubt many viewers will be interested in the severe outcome data updated uh, regularly for school-aged kids. That can be found on Aaron's site in a section called Severe Outcomes. And the top few lines will be dedicated to the age groups uh, that are youth. 
So the province doesn't release active hospitalizations due to COVID by age group. So we can only see the totals ever in the first three column, columns during the pandemic. And the last three, which are the changes that they do post. So on any given day, we don't know publicly uh, the age categories uh, as separated here. Um, but keep watching this space as we see the fourth wave and as schools um, are in session. So again, next slide, keep up to date. Please bookmark uh, this GitHub page and the charts for school age children are updated daily as the government releases data. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Dr. Lee. We did receive a lot of questions over the last 24 hours on reliable sources of information where parents, teachers, folks in general who are concerned about the health and well-being of our tiny humans, particularly those under 12 that are not eligible for vaccination, can look for reliable, transparent information. So hopefully this will have been a huge help to some of our viewers. I'm going to bring Jason Schilling into this portion of, portion of our conversation and take one of the questions that we received overnight from viewers at home. Um, do either of you guys have any advice on negotiating with school administration about the importance of ventilation in the classrooms? A lot of people were getting in touch with us about offers to purchase air purifiers that have just left, right, and center been politely declined. And they don't know where to go, who to talk to, how to make sure that the school boards are looking at the current science as opposed to what we knew in March of 2020. That's a great question, and uh, thank you. And I will—I don't know if Dr. Lee wants to make a, a comment about it first, but I would say um, it's one of those things too that I think the association has been working with, um, advocating to school boards that they and government that they need to make sure that they're funding properly the ability for schools to be able to look at um, air filtration systems within their buildings. And we've been calling for that for well over a year. I think it's one of those things that gets caught up in the bureaucracy of, of um, school boards and so I think it's a matter of um, different levels of, of conversation at our level provincially with uh, the ministry and then also with our locals talking with their separate school boards to see how we can navigate our way through this to make sure that we can get the things that we need in our classrooms in our schools across this province to ensure the safety of those who are learning and working in those buildings. Yes, and then just to add to that, I would suggest any parents that are engaged and in tune with our series to send to their uh, leadership in school, to their school board trustees, superintendents, the uh, presentation that Connor gave mm -hmm. yesterday uh, about aerosol transmission, because a lot of the schools have guidelines that predate COVID-19. So a lot of the responses we see is, you know, we are up to par, but those standards, which many might not even know in administration is outdated. Um, the other thing I would bring up is that this is really an equity issue, which is why we push on the government to centrally fund um, HEPA filters and appropriate yeah. assessment, because you can have one classroom that had a donated you know, donated unit and the next classroom doesn't, every student in Alberta should have equal protection. I'd like to bring Connor Rizicki into this question as well. Um, Connor, if you could let folks know where they could access the presentation that you shared with us yesterday, as well as I saw you talking about some additional things relating to A-Share a earlier today that folks at home might really want to know about. Yeah, so we have a recording following um, the presentation on Wednesday of that about 15 minute segment that I was giving on aerosol transmission, airborne transmission, I mean. Um, so viewers can access that on, I think, the Pop Alberta um, Twitter feed, and mm -hmm. I'll post that as well on my own later um, after we're done this today. But I wanted to note that uh, APEGA, our professional engineering association, really clarified their stance on airborne transmission actually just yesterday. Uh, and has acknowledged that, um, you know, airborne transmission is important, is significant, and should be addressed um, in these different sorts of environments like schools, you know, workplaces, all those sorts of things. So I would really encourage, um, you know, collaboration between school boards and between members of APEGA because there is very, there is a large wealth of expertise in this province um, for people who are involved in HVAC engineering who can assist in these sorts of matters more directly. 
on that same note, we also had a lot of questions concerning what parents can do to, I guess, who they can talk to, who they can contact around dispelling a lot of those hygiene theater myths um, and sort of what the ATA's position is and what support our school's position is on so many school boards continuing to advocate or implement, I guess, and to outdated information from earlier this year. And who do you call? Is it a you call your school board trustees? Is it a you talk to your principal? That negotiation piece seems to be quite nerve wracking for a lot of people this week. And I suspect even more so as we transition through the fall. Well, I would start with uh, the school board and the superintendent and central office when you're advocating for those sort of things um, to because they're the ones who are ultimately going to make the decisions that are pushed down onto um, schools and how they're going to follow those rules. So that would be the start. Um, that's where I would start with that as well. And also encourage them um, to make sure that uh, the school boards and their trustees are are getting the latest science that they can get around this so that we know, um, you know, what we knew in March 2020 and what we know now are entirely different things and to make sure that we're working with the information that's most up to date. Wing, do you have any added suggestions or thoughts for people who are looking to support their students? I would also add, along with what Jason said, is uh, parent councils. So there's power in numbers. And so if you as a parent can find other parents in your school that, you know, support the stances that science has shown us, um, it's better to approach as a group. And of course, I, I would not leave out contacting your MLAs, continuing to do so, again, because the funding and resources does have to come from the government too. Thank you very much. I would like to bring Dr. Carolyn Bezenko into the conversation as we talk about ways that we can support our tiny humans. Hi, Dr. Bezenko, how's it going? I'm good, thank you. Okay, please introduce yeah. yourself. Uh, I am Dr. Carolyn Bezenko. I am a registered psychologist working with families and kiddos um, and really a lot of work around anxiety these days, I would say. It's gone up quite a bit. Um, and, you know, one of the things that I tell parents, if you're doing good, your kids are probably doing pretty good too. A lot of the uncertainty and stress and the bombardment that we're getting from the, the media and the conversations that we're having with our kids. I mean, all of that stressing us out and we're getting worried about our kids and going to school, that's creating a lot of stress in us. And it kind of trickles down to our kids as well. I mean, when we look at everything, um, the things that we could be doing, even just around mask wearing, for example, what your attitudes and your beliefs are around the mask greatly influence your kids. So kids are looking around them, you know, to determine if they should be wearing masks or not. And if they believe that it's socially acceptable and I'm wearing them and everybody else is wearing them, they report that it's comfortable. I was even asking my girls last night, you know, what do you think about wearing masks? And my teenage daughter is like, well, it covers all my pimples. And my younger one is like, kids are gross. So it's good. Like, I don't have to see their mouth and things like that. It's all about our attitude. And so that's a huge piece. Dysregulated adults can't help regulate their kids. And so if you're going to help anybody, the first thing you've got to do, we all know, you know, I know I'm going to hear a lot of groans and eye rolls, put on your own oxygen mask. But truly, if you're doing good and you're able to regulate and you're able to cope, that's going to help your kids significantly. And so I think that that's sort of the first place where we need to self-reflect on how we're doing. And if we're getting stressed out, is that trickling down on our kids? Um, really, it's the mixed messages. If we're going to be talking about COVID specifically, um, you know, if they're not understanding COVID and they're being bombarded with all of that information, kids have magical thinking. Even our teenagers have this magical thinking and they start filling in the gaps. And when they fill in the gaps, our brain, that the part of the brain that does that is usually the fear mongering part of our brain. And so they're creating these conspiracy stories in their head. And so it's that misinformation and gaps of information that can be really harmful. And so when it's creating uncertainty, that is going to affect their self-efficacy, for example. So we need to think about what information we're sharing and the way that we're sharing information as well, because you know, if that's going to super adaptable. They really are adaptable. I know there's a lot of concerns about development and, and, and everything else that's going on, but they are very adaptable. 
what's helpful is providing our kiddos accurate information, age appropriate information about COVID, about mask wearing, how to wear it properly, how to take care of it. All of those things are going to be very really important. Um, and as well, just making sure that they're having meaningful interactions, play with them, laugh with them, talk with them, talk about the feelings. All of these things are going to be really important. Um, listening to them, I've already kind of talked about that structure, consistent schedules, all of those things, getting outside, having novelty in your life. I think that that's really important. I mean, I am very strict with screens. We don't watch TV. We don't have any electronics in my home. But I tell you, the past year and a half, the amount of TV I've watched with my kiddos, and we've kind of gotten sucked into this hole. And my girls were even just commenting the other day, we don't do anything anymore other than just watch TV. That's our go-to. So it's getting out of that and getting back outside having the novelty in your life, doing things differently. I mean, being safe, right? And still following all of those rules. I think that that's really important. Having time for creative um, play and just creative pursuits is go going to be really important. And stability, no matter what, at the end of the day, that stability um, is, is going to be really important. Well, we're on that topic of masking and tiny humans, because that is something we did receive a lot of questions on yesterday. And I really appreciate you exploring some of the mental health side of it. I would also like to bring into our conversation, Dr. Tassine Leha, um, to talk a little bit about the medical side of masking. Now, as a pediatrician, well, we received a lot of questions around the germs that can be on masks, or can you possibly become sicker, touching, breathing as a tiny human, unable to regulate in that aspect, as well as different types of masking, whether or not they be cloth, whether or not they be smaller fit surgical, or whether or not they be KN95s for tiny humans. So any advice I think that you could offer from a pediatrician's perspective on how to keep those tiny humans safe both physically and psychologically in mask would be absolutely welcomed by those at home. For sure. Thank you, Michelle. Um, I just want to echo some of what Dr. Buzanko was saying about um, resiliency of children. And so children are very adaptable. They're very resilient. Uh, and so to them, wearing a mask is generally not burdensome. And I see this in my patients. Um, I see this in kids around me. Uh, they do it quite well. They do it quite easily. Once they learn that it's the socially acceptable thing to do, they they, they do it. Um, they do it well and they accept it. And so um, that's certainly reassuring. And then from a medical perspective, um, I know a lot of parents have heard a concern about masking affecting childhood development. And the American Academy of Pediatrics recently came out with a statement indicating that there's no evidence that masking actually negatively impacts learning and development. Um, and I've experienced this myself in clinic with patients. So even in infants and in toddlers, uh, if I smile at them in my mask, they will smile and interact back. Um, and so that's quite reassuring to see. And there's also evidence that visually impaired children, um, they develop speech and language uh, at the same rate as non-visually impaired children. And so what that tells us is that, uh, you know, when children are masked and when others are masked around them, they use other cues to learn. So they use gestures, they use um, tone, uh, they use emotion that they see in the eyes. Um, and so this, this really doesn't have a negative impact on their development. Um, in terms of other questions about bacteria buildup and um, whether masks could actually be harmful for children, uh, if children are generally healthy, um, they, they shouldn't have any sort of issue with masking. And this is, of course, over the age of two, because under the age of two, um, it's very difficult to keep a mask on a child that young, um, and they may have some difficulty with breathing. But over that age, it certainly shouldn't interfere with their oxygenation. Um, and in terms of them touching it frequently and perhaps increasing the risk to themselves, uh, again, in my experience, experience when I see children masking, they actually mask better than some adults. And so when we when we role model for them how to correctly mask, how to put on the mask, how to take it off, how to keep it on, um, and we do so in a correct manner, children tend to follow that lead um, and also mask relatively well. And, and so 
What that means is that masking is beneficial for children in indoor public spaces, in schools. It does decrease transmission. It's one of the many layers of protection um, that we should be using in order to decrease COVID-19 uh, in the community and amongst our children. Um, and then the question that Michelle posed about surgical masks versus cloth masks versus N95 masks. It is true, all masks are not created equally. However, any sort of mask is generally better than no mask. Um, so in that sense, I do recommend masking. Um, unfortunately, some of the better quality masks are more expensive. And so I realize when I'm giving these recommendations that it's not necessarily equitable um, because parents are having the burden of this cost on themselves rather than being supported by the government or having funding for these masks for their children in schools. Um, and so, Technically, a three-layer cloth mask with a very good inner filtration layer uh, would be better than um, a one-layer or two-layer cloth mask. Um, and then with those same guidelines in mind, a KN95 that fits a child well um, would generally be better than a cloth mask. Um, and so if those are affordable options, there are certainly um, some available and that could be better in protecting your children. Um, but again, this is a, a matter of equity. And um, when we're looking at masks, it would be optimal if we could provide those at high risk, um, in high risk workplaces, in high risk situations, as well as all our children, high quality masks. So that burden isn't um, being uh, borne by the parents. Thank you. We also received a number of questions around MSC and tiny humans. Um, whether or not it has been a problem throughout our province. Um, and I will allow you to explain a little bit about what that means as opposed to me attempting to. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, so Miss C is multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children, and it's one of the severe manifestations of COVID-19 in children. Um, it has varying rates reported in in research and before, and so we've seen between 0.1%, um, sometimes as low as 0.01% of children who get Miss C. And Miss C can present with um, a wide range of symptoms. It always includes fever, and then it includes inflammation of different parts of the body. So children can present with rash, um, they can present with vomiting, diarrhea, headache, fatigue. Um, they can also have swelling of their heart, um, kidney issues, they can present in shock. And so up to 30% or more of these children require an ICU admission, and they all require hospitalization. Um, and so Miss C is quite a serious uh, manifestation of COVID-19. It is relatively rare, uh, but it has, it has been uh, an issue everywhere, including in Alberta. Um, I believe... Uh, as of spring, there had been a count of about 50 children in Alberta who had experienced Miss C. Um, and, you know, the, the issue is that on an individual level, so each child's risk of having Miss C or severe illness with COVID-19 is relatively low. However, on a population basis, um, as Dr. Gasporowicz showed in her graphs, if we allow tens of thousands of children in Alberta to become infected, for example, in schools uh, where masks aren't mandated or there are no protective public health measures, um, and we multiply those tens of thousands of children uh, by 0.1%, for example, we're looking at 50, 100 or more children that will end up being hospitalized with Ms. C. And for an, an illness, for COVID-19, which is a vaccine-preventable illness, where vaccines for the under-12 age group are likely within six months away, um, it's unacceptable for a child to become severely ill when all we need to do is implement some basic protective public health measures um, to prevent this from happening. Thank you so very much. Mm -hmm. I am going to bring into our conversation Dr. Lorianne Hardcastle. Hi, Dr. Hardcastle. Thank you so much Hi, for being with us today. Did you want to briefly introduce yourself? And then I have a couple of questions for you from our viewers. Sure. Uh, I'm Lorianne Hardcastle. 
I am an associate professor and my area of research is health law and policy with a, a focus on public health law and a more recent focus on COVID-19 and the law. One of the questions that we received a fair bit, um, which I think is an excellent question for you and Dr. Lee and Jason Schilling may or may not want to be involved in this one as well. A lot of parents slash even this person had said schools as well, are trying to figure out how best to facilitate the communication of positive cases. Um, since it seems like no one's going to be sharing this information and everyone is going to be in the dark, I think a number of parents were really curious to know whether or not they had any legal rights to know what was happening in their classrooms and what their children could be potentially exposed to. I think that the, the best way to, to address this issue is, is really to put pressure at the board level to do contact tracing. Um, AHS has, has seemed to say that they're not going to do it anymore. Um, certainly, you can put continued pressure on your uh, representatives, your MLAs, to, to do that. But at least one school board, uh, I, think the, I think it's the Calgary Catholic, um, although I may be wrong, there has announced that they're going to convey positive results to to parents when they receive those and so i think that the best thing that can be done is is to apply that pressure to the school board uh unfortunately we're in a situation where schools businesses post-secondary institutions uh, municipalities have all had to fill in a gap left by the government's failure to have these over arching uh, policies that protect all of society. So just keep applying pressure. I think especially at the school board level, um, can be they can be quite sensitive to parental pressure to take action. Yes, absolutely. And we saw last year that public health tracing, although it had at times had buckled, it was a foundational pillar of being able to monitor school transmission and have that data public. So one thing I would add is that this is actually a community issue as well, not knowing what's happening in the community school that's got a large population of the community's children, then it becomes just, you know, a risk larger than the school community. Um, yeah, and I would say uh, beyond uh, school boards, I'd also still keep putting pressure on um, to our MLAs. This is a job of Alberta Health Services. And what we saw last year when contact tracing fell apart is that it fell onto schools to keep up with this. And it put a lot of pressure on principals, on um, uh, staff that are working at the building to try to do the contact tracing on top of everything else that they were doing that in the building in terms of just their work. And it was unfair to put... Um, principals and uh, vice principals administrators in that position to pick up the failure of the government to do that. Um, I think as we move forward, we need to keep that pressure on because we saw in the summer the the taking off of we weren't going to test, isolate, or contact trace. And it's been haphazardly extended to September 27th. But what happens after that? Because school communities very much dependent on this information about how to keep the people who are in those buildings safe. And uh, that's also changed too from uh, early we were talking about the, the level of outbreaks, the thresholds um, for schools to know if they had an outbreak or if they just had cases. That level has changed as well. And now it's 10% um, within a, you know, absentees rate within a building and, and a larger high school in an urban center that has 200 kids. That's 200 kids. By then it's too late. Thank you so very much for all of your perspectives on that. Um, one more question for you, Dr. Hardcastle. It's a big one, um, but it was heavily liked, I guess, um, voted up um, throughout our viewers at home is, can you comment from a legal standpoint if our government has broken any laws with the dereliction of duty in failing to provide the minimum public health protection and what can we as citizens do about it? Well, I certainly think there have been moral and, and ethical failings as a as a government in terms of of not acting to protect citizens quickly enough, and and indeed in the past month in their lack of accountability and answerability to to citizens. Um, you know, unfortunately, from a, a legal perspective, um, it, it's tricky to hold the government to hold a, a majority government responsible uh, for its policy decisions. Um, without getting too much into the weeds of the law, 
uh, generally speaking, the, the courts have left governments who, who are elected and they are not room to, to make those big picture, high level policy decisions um, w without generally uh, too much interference. Uh, if we're talking about negligence, let's say, with the exception of something like uh, the government's acted in bad faith. So it's a it's a high bar in terms of the law to, to try and compel the government to take action where it's chosen not to take policy action. Um, the other issue with the law is that is that it's slow. It can be slow to get legal remedies. And with children going back to school or having already gone back to school, I tend to think of the big kids I teach, which they go back next week. But um, with people already already back in school, I think that legal remedies can sometimes be too slow coming. And so I think, again, the, the best thing we can do today is, is to push your city council if um, you know, live in a city where uh, there, there are things they might do to, to improve uh, public health within the municipality. Um, push local businesses to, to have public health requirements that exceed what the province has in place. Um, push school boards to, to, to do what they can um, and, and keep calling your MLAs, keep pushing your MLAs. I think in some ways these grassroots efforts have and will continue to be more effective than some of the, the legal remedies, which, which can be so slow. Thank you so very much. We are going to do two more questions before we say goodbye today, just because we are fastly running out of time. I am going to bring a bunch of people into the stream from our conversation today to ask you all some final thoughts. We are going to start with indoor eating protocols in schools, friends. We have had a lot of concern from the school community around why their children can't eat lunch outside and if they are in a school board that is masked during the day what the impact of that 20 minutes mask free with everybody is going to look like i can i can uh, have a first crack at this one so as as an aerosol scientist um, i can tell you that the exact situations you want to be avoiding are the ones where you have a large number of people unmasked at the same time um, so that is exactly what that sort of uh, uh, lunchtime activity would would, would obviously necessitate. So um, I would encourage um, as much as we possibly can uh, to be avoiding those sorts of situations by trying to move outdoors while the weather is nice for this sort of, um, you know, take advantage really in the next the next few months of, of the wonderful weather and, and try to move outdoors where the risk of transmission is much, much lower. Um, so those are the sorts of things. These are relatively easy things we can do in the next few months to really try to help reduce the amount of transmission in schools. And I, I think that's kind of exactly what we need to be doing. Jason, Jason. Lee, slash anybody else who might, sorry, Dr. Lita, just one second. A lot of the feedback we received from parents was that the schools are refusing to let that happen. I don't know if that's a board thing. I don't know if that's a school level thing. Most of those were coming from the under 12s who are unvaccinated and supervision came up as an issue, that sort of thing. From that more sort of policy slash procedural side of things, is there any suggestions or offers that folks have for those parents as to what to do? Someone even asked, should I be picking my child up every day at lunch if I can and bringing them home for that time period? It really does seem to be a high concern item for a lot of folks. Definitely a, a high concern for for teachers and stuff as well who are working in these classrooms with students as well. So I think it's again, it's going back and speaking to your school board, your your trustees, um, especially your central office staff superintendents who are making these decisions and then pushing them down to uh, to schools and individual individual schools to have conversations with and to you know listen to the experts like you have gathered here today who are giving really good sound advice about what we can do in the in the interim to mitigate these things and if going outside for lunch um, makes sense, but there's a lot of different factors in, in there as well. And supervision is one of them. And and it's working these things out in, in a, a time that we've never really had to work these things out in this way. And uh, it's trying to get the right answer. And that's always um, a little bit hard to get to sometimes. I always say we're limited by our own create creativity. And I don't know, maybe I'm stepping a line and I apologize if I do. I, I don't know if this is even feasible, but you know, 
as a parent, I would be more than happy to volunteer to come to lunch and be able to supervise groups. And I know that they're paid positions and there's things like that. So that's why I'm not sure if this is even possible, but can we look outside the box? Are there other things that we can be doing? Because I'm sure the community will come together so that we can ensure that our kids can still come to school and still have these really important experiences, but still stay safe. I just, I just wanted to add, you know, I really empathize with parents right now. This is a really difficult time. Um, and these sorts of decisions and fears uh, should not be on the shoulders of parents. This weight should not be on parents' shoulders. Um, these issues about how to protect our children are systemic issues. They should not be handed down to individual parents uh, for them to figure out how to keep their own child safe in a, in a setting such as school that is supposed to be safe. This is on our uh, government, on our public health leadership that should be making sure that community transmission is low enough that children can attend school safely without parents fearing for their health and for their lives. Thank you so very much for that. Um, I'm going to have to unfortunately say that I think that is all the time that we have today. Um, thank you so very much, everyone, for joining us, not just our experts on the panel, but everyone who is watching from various devices at home. Um, it's going to be an interesting fall. Um, yeah, it's been an exceptionally busy week, and the amount of support that Protect Our Province Alberta has received from Albertans has been truly inspirational. So that is one positive that I am going to take away from the week, if nothing else. Um, it's obvious to me that we are a province of people who really do care about the overall health and well-being of our fellow community members, and that inspires me so very, very much. Um, we will be back on Wednesday, September 8th, 2021, for a briefing on healthcare capacity. I know that we are going to revisit schools within the next couple of weeks because, one, it is obviously a high priority item for all of our citizens. Two, those tiny humans sacrificed so much last year mm -hmm. that it is imperative that we support them as they go through the fall when they are the least protected all those under 12 non-protected group in our society right now. So once again, thank you so very, very much to everyone who joined us today, both at home and in the stream. We look forward to seeing you back September 8th. And until then, have a great weekend and stay safe, everybody.